government to parliament today. The next item of business is a debate on the Scottish Government's programme of Government 2014-15. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now. And I call Jackie Bailey. Much, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to respond to this debate on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party and congratulate the new First Minister on bringing forward her first programme for government. This is, of course, the first post-referendum legislative agenda presented by the government. It is being presented in a Scotland that is, as others have say, said, changed and changed utterly. The passion and energy of the referendum, a passion that came from the ground up on both sides, rather than being directed by politicians, means business as usual is no longer good enough. When 85% of the electorate take part in a vote in Scotland, the old way of doing things just won't work anymore. So we must all change, and that includes the Scottish Government. Voters will rightly judge the First Minister and her government on results, not rhetoric. Indeed, they might even hold your feet to the fire on promises of greater social justice. But Scottish Labour wants to see a programme for government which puts cutting inequality at the heart of absolutely everything we do. We believe that social justice should not just be an empty slogan, but the central strategy that makes our country and our communities healthier, wealthier and happier. Because simply talking about social justice doesn't pay the bills or lift a single person out of poverty. Now, I see lots of summits, commissions and conventions in the First Minister's statement. Perhaps these are the new vehicles for the new consensus, and I welcome that. But it's not a substitute for actually taking action. It's welcome that the SNP have decided to prioritise social justice. It's something that they have had the power to deliver from the beginning. For me, there is no greater ambition for government. So if this government brings forward legislation or takes action to tackle inequality, the Scottish Labour Party will support it. Whilst it remains to be seen whether the new First Minister will turn out to be different from her predecessor on social justice, in one crucial aspect, there can be no debating a major change. The First Minister is a woman, and that indeed is cause for celebration. It sends a signal, as she said herself, to every young girl and child, uh, sorry, every young um, woman and every girl in Scotland that they can reach the top of their chosen profession without gender acting as a barrier. We on these benches have long advocated equality for women in politics. We were the first to have a 50-50 gender balance in our parliamentary party, the first to introduce all women shortlists. The new 50-50 Scottish Cabinet is to be welcomed. It is a great start. But as the First Minister already knows herself, um, it isn't enough. And I welcome her commitment to 50-50 by 2020. But, you know, you can do that for public bodies right now. You don't need quotas in order to, to do that. Ministers make all of the appointments. And we know that the boards of our public bodies are dominated by men. I won't th run through the list, but just look at Scottish Enterprise. A mere three women to nine men. What signal are we sending about women in the economy? So if the First Minister is serious about breaking down the barriers for women in public life and not just in politics, then we agree 50-50 representation is essential, but we believe we can make progress right now. I hope the First Minister will also recognise the difficulty many women experience in the workplace. If the SNP really want to act on social justice, they could start by shining a light on the discrimination faced by working women. How about challenging every large private firm to audit and publish their pay gap? And let's do it for the public sector too. And let me turn to the living wage. Because we know, we all know, that the living wage will make a huge difference to women. We believe the Scottish Government should promote better pay with a living wage strategy and a living wage unit. A convention is welcome. But we can do more. We want to see the passion and energy the SNP showed for independence put into delivering better wages for workers across the country. Just a few months ago, we asked the First Minister, in her previous role, to support the living wage in all public sector contracts. She has the power to do so. 
It would guarantee a rise to workers in low-paid jobs such as cleaning, catering and caring, the majority of whom are women. If Renfrewshire Council can agree this with their private care providers, surely the government can do something too. The SNP indeed. John Mason. Uh, I wonder if the member then would agree that uh, the control over the statutory minimum wage should be devolved? Jackie Bailey. No, what I think is that the living wage is considerably... Oh. If you'd let me finish, the living wage is considerably higher. Actually, the debate in Scotland has moved on to the living wage, and I think that is critically important. But, you know, I welcome, I welcome the SNP's newfound interest in this, because you've voted against this in the past. In this year alone, you voted against the living wage no fewer than five times. Now, the people of Scotland deserve better than that. They should not have to put up with a Scottish government, no thank you, that talks left but walks right. Presiding officer, the reality for too many Scots is that work doesn't pay. It is a moral scandal that after seven years of an SNP government and four years of the Tories, some working families in Scotland rely on food banks and payday lenders to make ends meet. If the boiler breaks down or the electricity bill is higher than expected, they are in trouble because the cost of living crisis is increasing. Nearly one in five children in Scotland are living in relative poverty. That's an increase of 15% from the previous year. That's 30,000 more children living in poverty in Scotland today. And this is something that this Parliament and the First Minister can change. It was Scottish Labour that more than halved child poverty in just 10 years. We lifted 200,000 Scottish children out of poverty and we can do that again. The reality is, Presiding Officer, that this Chamber has always had significant powers to fight poverty. Bob Doris. One of the achievements of Labour and Government in the UK was the tax credit system, including the child tax credit system, that's been altered to make things worse for working families. We support the devolution of those powers to this Parliament so we can address it here, Ms Bailey. Jack Bailey. Look, the, the, the Smith Commission reports tomorrow. Um, you have people represented in that commission actually taking forward your agenda. Why don't you talk to John Swinney and we'll see what the consensus delivers tomorrow. But let me, let me talk about the powers you do have, because right? that would be interesting. Like housing, for example. On housing, this government has a shameful record. Scotland faces a social housing crisis. Order. Presiding officer, they don't like the facts, do they? They like to shout them down. Because Scotland faces... No. Scotland faces... Scotland faces... Well, answer this question then. Why is it that social housing in Scotland has been at a level now that hasn't been seen since the Second World War. This government is well on track to meet its target in social housing, but the question I wanted to ask Jackie Bailey is, can she remind the Chamber exactly how many council houses the last Labour administration built? Jackie Bailey. Perhaps, I know, I know, I know the First Minister is fixated on council houses. Perhaps she'd like to tell us... Perhaps she'd like to tell us how many built, were built by housing associations in the socially rented sector, because we built more than you're currently doing. But at this point, presiding officer, 180,000 Scots sit on waiting lists. 23,000 homes lie empty. The Scottish Government's own statistics from yesterday showed a 22% drop in social housing completions in the last year. That's not a record to be proud of. If this Government is serious about tackling poverty, that has to change. And we also need to reform the private rented sector for those unable to access social housing or get a foot on the property ladder. We called for a ban for rip-off rent rises. The SNP said no. They voted with the Tories to protect rogue landlords rather than offer some support and protection to the one in four Scots who live in poverty in the private rented sector. But where's the bill? It's not here. Presiding officer, we are encouraged, though, by the First Minister's recent comments about the importance of childcare. We regard this as an economic issue, not a gender issue. Although it will come as a surprise to many Scots that a transformative childcare agenda does not require 
Scotland to leave the United Kingdom. As Scottish Labour has said all along, we need the political will to make a difference to families across this country. If we want a thriving economy, we need to fix the barrier for parents. It can also be a huge game changer in the fight against poverty. But our current childcare system isn't working. It needs to be more affordable, it needs to be more flexible, the costs are amongst the highest in Europe. And whilst the First Minister's ambition to make childcare free for 27% of two-year-olds is welcome, it would actually see Scotland lag behind England, where the figure is 40%. We cannot make all childcare free, but we can make it affordable and flexible. We are committed to capping childcare costs, and we're working through those details with experts. We would ensure a childcare place for every mother and father who wants to go to college to gain the skills needed for a job. The Scottish Government realised during the referendum that childcare was an important issue. It should remain one. But this programme for government doesn't have a bill to match that ambition. We're planning, we're in consultation, potentially we could be waiting six years to see a difference. That's a pity because you would have had our full support for taking radical action. The First Minister also has to accept that her government has presided over budgets that have disproportionately hurt the poorest people in Scotland. The government's cuts to local authorities have scarred our communities. These cuts are felt on the front line, on the public services most relied upon by our poor and our vulnerable. There are 70,000, if you can explain to me why there are 70,000 fewer local government workers and why the bulk of them are women. I simply want to ask Jackie Bailey, on how many occasions has the Labour Party at any stage asked me to give local government more money in the formal budget negotiations? The answer, because she won't give it, is on no occasions whatsoever. Jackie Bailey. As a, as a former lo local government worker, I'm always happy to see more money given to local government because they will do something about it. But can I say there are, as a consequence of John Swinney's decisions, his government's decisions, 70,000 fewer local government workers in Scotland today. So we welcome the government's intention to finally do something about the council tax freeze. I'm not opposed to a freeze. After all, no, 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 no. After all, it was Glasgow City Council that led the way. It is simply that the government have underfunded that promise. But a consultation is what we're promised, not legislation. So it's off into the long grass again. But as the First Minister knows, Scottish Labour led the way on land reform with a series of radical measures, including the introduction of the right to roam and the ending of feudalism. So whatever the government now wants to do on land reform, we will support as long as it is it meets the test of being radical. My colleague Claire Baker will say more about this later. But, presiding officer, few things unite us across this chamber more than the horror of domestic abuse. More needs to be done to end violence against women. As a minister, I was proud of Scottish Labour's work, which began to tackle the issue and which this current government have built on. But one in five women will experience domestic abuse at some point in their lives. So it's not an issue of party politics, it is an issue of human decency. I therefore very much welcome the government's intention to legislate in this area and indeed on revenge porn as well. They will have our full support for these measures. But can I ask the First Minister to clarify when we are likely to see that legislation, because we would support it being brought forward as quickly as possible. I'm also delighted to welcome the First Minister's commitment to taking forward a bill on human trafficking, initially introduced by my colleague Jenny Mara, and I do agree with her. I hope it can serve as an example of what can be achieved when we work together. Presiding officer, nobody will be um, in, in any doubt that winter is approaching. But for 900,000 Scots living in fuel poverty, this winter is something to dread. It means hardships, tough challenges, larger bills. The 2001 Housing Act, which we all supported in this chamber, pledged to eradicate fuel poverty by 2016. I think that target is unlikely to be met, although I would happily take an intervention to be told I'm wrong. Well, there you go. And it is shameful that this government has underspent the fuel poverty budget at a time where the need is self-evident. As families across Scotland choose between heating and eating, the Scottish Government are doing nothing about it. But you know, it doesn't have to be like that. 
the First Minister, in the spirit of the new consensus, should join with Scottish Labour and support a freeze on energy prices. We know that the SNP wanted to give energy companies a double windfall in the shape of a corporation tax cut and by removing the green levy. But I hope that their newfound commitment to social, social justice will see them support our plans, which would save every Scottish household an average of £120 while we overhaul the energy market and take on vested interests. We already have a fuel poverty strategy produced by Scottish Labour, which I would commend to the First Minister. Presiding officer, a new area means a new cabinet, but it's not without its challenges. Our NHS is in crisis, whilst education budgets have been slashed. Change at the top means nothing if the new faces don't have a new approach. It is disappointing that this agenda contains little action to repair our broken NHS, because it's clear that urgent action is what is needed. Delayed discharge is up by 106% since last year, as more patients take up beds they no longer need due to the lack of care packages. NHS complaints are up by 23%. A&E waiting times are not being met. Cancer waiting times are being missed. And just this week, we find that promises made by the Scottish Government on access to cancer medicines have been broken. When in opposition, the First Minister promised to increase the number of available hospital beds. Yet Scotland's hospital beds are disappearing faster than almost anywhere else in the Western world. More than 6,000 beds have been withdrawn from Scottish hospitals over the last 10 years, a drop of 21%. Now, I care passionately about our NHS. I care passionately about all those who work in it. I know the First Minister does too, but they face challenges. As our NHS teeters on the brink, this government's response is inadequate. Our NHS deserves much better than this. That's why we believe it's a time for a fundamental review of the NHS to make sure our resources are being put in the right place to strengthen the NHS for decades to come. It's time for a beverage report for the 21st century. Presiding officer, when the previous First Minister left office, he called free tuition his greatest achievement. There's even a large rock sculpture to prove it, but the reality is different. For thousands of Scots, education at any level means being caught between a rock and a hard place, and the numbers speak for themselves. The budget for further education slashed by 67 million. Number of college students in Scotland cut by over 140,000. The number of Scottish students attending university down by 12,000, and for those from the poorest backgrounds, by over 3,500. Students' bursaries cut by 35%, while student debt has shot up to 69% in the last year alone. In numeracy and literacy, the government has failed to close the inequality, inequality gap. The real silver bullet in battling poverty is education. Yet, we've lost 4,000 teachers since 2007. The SNP promised to halve classroom sizes in our primary schools. The member's Lies just winding up. At every level of education, the SNP is failing Scotland. Presiding officer, may I take a final moment to pay tribute to the incredible campaigning of Gordon Aikman. I have known and worked alongside Gordon for years, and it would be wonderful if his diagnosis could leave a lasting positive legacy for vulnerable people across Scotland. So I welcome the First Minister's pledge today. I support her action to ensure that local authorities do not charge for those requiring care that have a terminal illness. And I also support the measures on the carers' bills. But in Concluding, presiding officer, charging in social care is, of course, something that is wider. For under 65s in non-residential care, they're increasingly having to contribute higher proportions of their benefit towards the cost of care. Some have cancelled services as a result. The care tax is a tax on the most vulnerable members of our community. It is a tax working together we can abolish. It would cost about 50 million to do so. I would urge her, in the interests of fairness and equality, if this government is to protect the most vulnerable and deliver social justice, then do it. I now call Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister has made a point at this, the start of her period of office, of saying that she will be a listening First Minister, one who works with people from any and all political stripes where there is agreement. She'll be open to ideas and suggestions for improvement. And I welcome this approach. 
Last week, I laid out a Conservative vision that I believe would make our country better, using the taxation powers coming to this Parliament to reduce the financial burden on Scotland's families, on introducing school choice in order to drive up standards, in recognising the importance of our colleges and stopping the political vandalism that's seen 140,000 places cut under this government and creating a Scotland where we value our vocational education as highly as our academic one. Stopping the removal of £60 million each and every year from our nation's health budget by giving free prescriptions to the better off in our society, those who had previously been happy to pay a contribution. And rather, use that money, that £60 million, to fund a thousand extra nurses and midwives across our land. The First Minister said that there was little here upon which we could agree. So let me appeal to the angel of her better nature in areas where we might. If we look at the new bills unveiled today, and firstly, those already in train. The First Minister is a lawyer by trade. She understands the concept of due process. She's also been a, a politician for five times as long as she ever practiced law. She understands legislation. It was simply wrong to attempt the scrapping of the centuries-old tenet of corroboration without telling MSPs in this chamber, never mind the public at large, what would replace it. Loyal to her colleagues as she is, she has a great opportunity as a new First Minister with a new Justice Secretary to revisit the fudge that came out of that aborted parliamentary fix. So as the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill makes its passage through this Parliament, let's get back to first principles. How do we better secure justice for our victims and fairness for the accused? We need the wholesale review of the law of evidence that the Conservatives have been calling for here, and we will help in any way that we can to clean up the mess which has been created. On Thursday, I asked our new First Minister about ending automatic early release. The Parliament's own independent information service showed that fewer than 1% of criminals jailed would be subject to the sentence handed down under the SNP's current plans. She said that there would be opportunities to amend the Prisoner Control of Release Scotland Bill in this legislative diet. I am asking for assurances that improvements put forward in good faith to stop those who break their contract with society having their prison doors flung open early are considered in that same good faith in which they are offered. This should be an area on which there is agreement. It was in the SNP manifesto of both 2007 and 2011 that a pledge to end automatic early release was given. That pledge is not honoured if it does not apply to over 99% of our prison population. The government has been in power for more than seven years, and for each of those seven years, it has said it believes in this and it has promised to deliver it. Let's make that happen in the final 18 months of this parliament. But it's not just areas of justice where we want to help the new First Minister, but areas of social justice too. Nicola Sturgeon, having said that such improvements to childcare could only happen under independence, has now found a way with this bill unveiled today to address this under the powers of devolution. The Scottish Conservatives have always placed great import on early years education. We applaud moves to increase provision to two-year-olds. Indeed, I am long on record decrying the fact that Scotland lags behind south of the border in this very area. However, we see nothing socially just nothing socially just at all in the idea that the amount of provision re you receive depends upon a fluke of nature or a lottery of birth. It is not just, socially or otherwise, that families with children born in one half of the year benefit more than families with children born in another. Not just that only half of families in Scotland benefit from two full years of free provision at all. The First Minister is a smart lady. It cannot be beyond the wit of man or women to address this inequity and with this bill we will support any attempts to do so. We can also support, should Smith deliver the powers for it, votes for 16 year olds in future Scottish elections. We support increasing apprenticeships. We support the rollout of Clare's Law which we called for and we can support future human trafficking legislation. We also support, not at this time, we also support a belated commitment to increasing health spending. The rise in NHS spend each year down south means each year this Scottish Government's health consequentials have also risen. Those millions have not always been delivered by this Government to Scotland's health service, and external bodies agree. It is long past time that it did so. 
If the First Minister actually honours today's commitment, then we welcome that too. But it is the areas of the wider economy to which I wish to turn. There has been much fanfare today. Indeed, it was briefed to journalists overnight that today's programme would contain significant new measures to boost Scotland's economy. I fear that they are, at best, underwhelming. While I back the rates relief and small business bonus conditions announced today, this government has a far greater number of levers at its disposal which it is not using or is hindering, not helping business. This government has talked many times in many ways of creating the most business-friendly environment, the most competitive tax regime, the most attractive business solutions. But let's look at the record set against the promises. What happened to promises in the 2011 SNP manifesto to help create new retail banks or to support social banking? Nothing. On the overall tax burden to business, this government this year received £30 million in Barnet consequentials from a UK scheme that gives small high street shops and cafes an £1,000 rebate. The money was trousered, but the £1,000 rebate was never passed on. Our larger retailers hit with a mercurial £95 million smash and grab levy. Coming from nowhere, they hokey cokeyed in and out over three years to plug a funding gap. On behalf of businesses across Scotland, I am happy to cede the floor now to an intervention from any of the front bench team so that I can get an assurance and a guarantee that this unfair smash and grab retail levy is not going to raise its head again in this or any other form. I am sorry, Mr Macdonald, you do not quite qualify. I will give John Swinney. Uh, I am happy to confirm to Ruth Davidson that the Scottish Government, uh, as I have confirmed in the Budget, is not bringing forward a public health supplement. But having brought one forward, having had the gumption to do it, why is Ruth Davidson criticising us for investing that necessary resource in delivering preventative in interventions in our public services to tackle exactly the social injustices she's talking about in, in the debate? Ruth Davidson, I'm afraid you must begin to conclude. I beg your pardon, Deputy President Officer. I didn't you have eight answer. minutes, so you must begin to conclude. Sure. Um, the Finance Secretary cannot have it both ways. Either introducing a levy is an important and necessary ideal to help public health, or he doesn't need the money, which is why he scrapped it. Which way round is it? I don't think we've seen. So we have seen a uh, Tory uh, building land and buildings transaction tax, which not only delivers an eye-watering 10% on residential, but also has an inference on business premises. When you're talking about factory floor space and depots, warehousing and industrial units, why should it be, why does this government think it should be a good idea to make it financially more attractive to set up in Carlisle instead of Dumfries? I'm afraid there is no time in hand in the debate. I must ask you to come to a conclusion. I will come to a conclusion right now. Presiding officer, where we find a common cause, like an early release, like an extending childcare, we will work with this government to improve the situation. Where we see signs of life in trying to help business, we will encourage and conjole to deliver on promises made that are yet unfulfilled. And where we differ, sometimes categorically so, we will continue to state our case and challenge this government. This government has just 18 months left of a five-year term with a majority where it could have done so much more. It needs to get a move on. Thank you. I now call in Willie Rennie, and I must ask you to keep to your six minutes, please. Um, exactly, President Officer. Um, by the time this debate concludes tomorrow afternoon, it is my hope and belief and, in fact, expectation that Scotland will have an agreement on more powers that will match the spirit and the unique experience of the referendum, an agreement that will deliver for the Scottish Parliament the power to be flexible and agile so that we can do things differently if we choose. It is why we advocated the transfer of financial power, constitutional power and now welfare power. And crucially, it is also why we argued that this agreement on Scotland's future must not just be crafted by the referendum victors. So all parties are in the room for the first time ever, all five parties, including the SNP. And it is because we have set the right foundations that I am confident that we can secure a sustainable set of powers for this Parliament. But there, apart from the obvious winners during the referendum, there were two other significant winners. I think the first was 16 and 17 year olds who carried themselves with great dignity, great maturity and contributed in significant ways to the debate about the future of our country. And that's why we will pledge our support to accelerate as fast as we possibly can, so at the next election, 
that we can have 16 and 17 year old uh, voting in that election. The second victor, I think, during the referendum um, were the islands. The fact that they organised quite a dramatic campaign, an effective campaign that has secured more powers for their communities. And likewise, we will support the government on those grounds. And I'll take an intervention, unlike Ruth Davidson, to the great Mark, Mark McDonald. <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful to, uh, to Mr Rennie. Um, on the point of 16 and 17 year olds, I welcome the fact that we have cross party support for them to uh, be given the vote at the 2016 elections. There is, however, an election looming next year. And does Willie Rennie agree with me that it is a missed opportunity if the UK government does not take similar action to ensure that the voting age is lowered at UK elections as well, given that young people were enabled to vote on the most historic vote in this country? Willie Rennie. Uh, absolutely. I com agree completely. We should be using the opportunity of showing in the referendum how maturely um, that 16 and 17 year olds can deal with their democratic rights to move forward in Westminster. You won't find any disagreement uh, from me on that. We have advocated that for many, many, many years. Um, that we've got a fair, legal and decisive decision to reject independence means for the first time for many years that I can remember, um, we can assess legislation on its own merits without it being mired in the debate over independence. And I'm now sure that we can find alliances that were perhaps prevented in previous years. And in that spirit, I can welcome much of today's programme for government. I want a Scotland that strives for a fairer society and a stronger economy so that there is opportunity for everyone. That's what Liberal Democrats have always believed. Combined with strong Liberal values, real local power, real local power and protection for our environment, I think we can build a better country. There is much in this programme that we can agree with and I'm sure that others on other areas we will work constructively to make those bills better. But I want to focus on one important omission. We know that one in four people are likely to suffer from mental health problems at some point in their lives. But equally, a survey showed almost one in four people were not comfortable to make friends with someone with depression, to have them work as a work colleague, or even for them to move in next door. Our young people are facing long waits to begin treatment for mental health services. Too many wait six months to access treatment. That is an indefensible waiting time for a young person at such an important time in their lives. And that's why I'm delighted the UK coalition government had written into law that for the first time mental health and physical health will receive equal recognition. Getting the right combination of public mental health, anti-stigma, timely access to therapy and reliable crisis and emergency care will all be part of that picture. And I hope that we can persuade the new health minister, the new health secretary, to support such legislation in the future. Jim Hume has been um, moving forward um, with his bill on smoking in cars with children. I think he has made significant progress and made the weather in that area. And I hope that we can persuade the Health Secretary also to adopt his bill, support his bill, make sure his proposals are advanced forward. Because the kind of dangerous second-hand smoke in a confined space of a car, I think, some, think is something that we need to tackle. So I hope the government do look on that sympathetically as well. I hope the new Justice Secretary indicates um, a new direction of travel on the justice portfolio as well. The Chamber knows that we've got great reservations about the centralisation of the police, the lack of democracy in that system, the massive increase of stop and search, now seven times higher than in England, and police carrying guns. We have set down proposals that we believe that the Chief Constable's powers should be defined much more clearly, so that we can have much more control over how our police uh, works. I think the way that it is working just now is inadequate and needs to change. And that's why we will be hopefully talking to the new Justice Secretary about how, that pra how practically that can be achieved. I'm afraid you must draw to a close, please. Um, on one final point, Deputy Presiding Officer, is on nursery education. We, of course, welcome the development of the expansion in the next Parliament. 
but we think that expansion should be starting now. We are still lagging behind England on two-year-olds. Only 27% here, 40% in England. I think Scotland needs to catch up and catch up fast. If the new Education Secretary embraces that proposal, she will find willing participants on these benches. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I call on Alison Johnson, maximum six minutes. Neil Finlay, point of order. Apologies for raising the point of order, but in our speech, the uh, First Minister said that in relation to carers, the government was spending £114 million per year. But according to Spice, the figure is £114 million for the period 2007 to 2015. I wonder if it's possible to get the government to clarify that. And secondly, President Officer, uh, um, 18 months ago, the government said they would legislate to lo uh, uh, my lobby, Lobbying Transparency Scotland Bill, but there's no bill within the legislative programme. I wonder what you can do to protect the rights of members. Order, please. Protect the rights of members who Thank bring you. forward Thank legislation, you, Mr. but see the government playing games to prevent it. Thank you, forward. Mr. Finlay. I appreciate that these are debating points, they're not points of order. However, as members well know, if they have inadvertently um, made a mistake with figures at all, then there are opportunities to change that in the official report. But those are debating points. I now call on Alison Johnston. Six minutes, please. Um, thank you. There are many legislative proposals to scrutinise and much for the government to achieve. We have a new First Minister, a new Deputy First Minister and a refreshed and gender balanced ministerial team. And I'd like to take this opportunity to wish them well in their work. The First Minister set out her themes of social justice, the important work to deliver new powers to Scotland and the need to put people at the heart of decision making. The Smith Commission on New Powers will report tomorrow. This programme is about the powers we already have, the powers we must use as ambitiously as possible. There is much to welcome. I welcome the commitment to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote, the focus on tackling in work poverty, to end collection of debts from non-payment of the poll tax, the Scottish Business Pledge, action against domestic abuse, human trafficking legislation. But there are things missing from this legislation too, from this programme. We're missing a way to deliver a step change in the energy efficiency of our existing homes and workplaces, as well as tackling fuel poverty. WWF point out that an energy efficiency industry could provide 3,500 jobs in the short term, some 9,000 by 2027, an opportunity for modern apprenticeships and becoming expert at treating hard-to-treat houses. John Swinney responded very positively to my suggestion during the Economy Committee's budget work that energy efficiency should become a national infrastructure priority and clearly understands the link between the need to retrofit our homes and the opportunities this provides. Much needed new jobs, important new skills. We need affordable rents and we need affordable heat. But to deliver this, we need ambition and a tight timescale on the regulation of energy efficiency in private sector homes. Alex Neil, from his time as Infrastructure Secretary, also understands the energy efficiency challenge in existing homes. This is back in his portfolio, and I hope he'll meet the challenge head on. Rosanna Cunningham, as the new Fair Work and Skills Secretary, has an important role to play in creating a workforce, a workforce with skills in sustainable construction and retrofitting. Also missing is a private renting bill. The government announced that it would bring forward legislation during this session of Parliament on the private rented sector to make private renting more secure. But this seems to have disappeared and I would welcome some clarity. The consultation is open now, but if legislation isn't introduced in good time, the issue may end up being kicked into the long grass. I'd like to welcome Angela Constance to her cabinet role. The First Minister has been clear today that there's more to do on attainment and I welcome the two new bills. I fully support the Wood Commission's call for parity of esteem and encouraging a culture that doesn't see colleges playing second fiddle to universities. They provide the flexible learning that people need to have opportunities in life, linking into the First Minister's theme today. Childcare is a key component of allowing people to study and work flexibly. I welcome the increase in hours, but it's important that we do this with the child's best interests at heart, not just the economies. To give children the best start in life means parental involvement as well as high quality play, care and education. There may well be merit in starting formal education later in life, but that doesn't mean that childcare professionals aren't playing a vital part in a child's life. More hours must be linked with flexibility and delivered by qualified, well-paid staff. 
I'd like to highlight, too, citizenship education, the need for this. It's not a legislative proposal, but the referendum has shown how young people are and want to be active citizens, and we should make sure that our schools have the resources and the confidence to support and promote that citizenship. I'm pleased to see proposals on land reform, in particular the removal of business rate exemptions for shooting and deer stocking estates, and the measures on transparency of land ownership, which I hope include beneficial ownership. Land reform is a broad topic. It's an urban issue as well as a rural one. Delivering social justice and a fairer economy at a time of austerity is hugely challenging, but land reform is an opportunity within the Parliament's powers. High land prices push up house prices. The Cabinet Secretary's budget expects house prices to rise at 5% over the next two years. At the same time, wages are stagnant and struggling to catch up with inflation. And I hope the First Minister sees that land reform is linked intrinsically with tax reform. The council tax, in our view, is unfair, but so is a freeze. It disempowers local authorities, it centralises, and it results in cuts to public services and forces councils into charging regressive fees. I welcome the announcement of a commission on fairer alternatives to the council tax. Local taxation has a massive impact on people's lives. It's a powerful tool. The commission needs to look more broadly at the whole of local taxation, including non-domestic rates, and seriously consider a land value tax and the recommendations from COSLA's important report on empowering local democracy. The First Minister's focus today on creating a society where everyone has the same chance in life is welcome. But transport is an area of government where there are stark inequalities. We've created a transport system where the car is king. If you walk or cycle through our towns and cities, it's clear who rules the road. Another dimension to transport inequality is the straight up fact that a large proportion of people don't or can't use or afford to run a car. Derek Mackay will understand the challenges to changing our cities from his time as planning minister and Keith Brown, as his cabinet secretary, knows the ins and outs of the transport brief. But I hope that they will work together on a project for transport justice for Scotland. But there are no proposals here today and I would suggest that better buses be the first step on this journey. I look forward to working with the First Minister and her team in as constructive a way as possible. The Green and Independent Group will continue to oppose government policies where we don't agree, but we are, as I'm sure ministers are, open to working constructively wherever possible. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. We are extremely tight for time. Can I remind members, though, that if they're participating in this debate over the two days, they should be here for opening speeches and they should be here again tomorrow for closing speeches. Kevin Stewart to be followed by Claire Baker, speeches of a maximum of six minutes. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And it's quite often in this chamber that I feel like I'm in a parallel universe. Uh, the First Minister stood up today uh, and gave a very positive speech about the government's programme for government uh, and the opposition parties uh, take a huge amount of it out of context and argue uh, against things that they have actually argued for themselves. And let me give you uh, an example of that uh, in terms of uh, Ms Bailey's opening speech, uh, round about uh, independent commission uh, on local, local government funding, which I welcome. Uh, which is something that Alec Rowley and Anne McTaggart called for in uh, the Local Government and Regeneration Committee as part of our flexibility and autonomy for local government report. It seems today uh, that that's no longer what Labour wants to see. Um, also, she talked about teacher numbers um, uh, and a reduction in teacher numbers. Today, Mr Rowley at committee was arguing that there should be a flexibility on teacher numbers and the pupil-teacher ratio and local government itself should be able to choose if it wants to reduce numbers. Sometimes I get that parallel universe uh, feeling. I welcome the Independent Commission on Local Government Funding and I welcome uh, the, the news that uh, the, uh, the uh, council tax will continue to be frozen throughout this parliament. I also welcome the fact uh, of the introduction of the community charge debt bill, uh, which will see uh, the final demise uh, of uh, the uh, community charge, the poll tax, 24, 21 years after its ab abolition. And, you know, 
when we had a situation where nearly 85% of our fellow countrymen and women uh, who were registered turned out to vote in the referendum right across Scotland, I think that that was possible. That was possible uh, only because uh, people thought there was going to be a new society and that they were not going to be hounded for past debts. And I hope that we can, can continue to get people uh, to participate uh, in such large numbers. We cannot afford uh, to lose these people and we must harness people power by ensuring that more power is given to people. In recent weeks, the Parliament's Local Government and Regeneration Committee has been taking evidence on the Community Empowerment Bill and we've travelled to Dumfries and Fort William to hear the views of people there uh, and of the surrounding areas. Uh, in uh, Fort William the other night, uh, uh, we had the opportunity to meet the Buzz Project. Uh, I played drums, Bruce Crawford was on lead guitar, uh, and we got an idea of what that voluntary project uh, was doing right across the Loch Aber area without any council money and without any Scottish government money. These are the kind of things that we need to encourage. As well as being out and about, here in Parliament, we have heard from witnesses from Dundee, North Lanarkshire, Aberdeen, and from many other parts of Scotland. Uh, many of these folks are already very much empowered. Uh, we know that many communities are not quite in the same league. And I'm so pleased that there is to be extra £10 million in the Empowering Communities Fund because I believe that we still have a way to go in terms of community capacity building. And I think that that £10 million can do a lot in that regard. The message that we have received from people is that they want to be more involved in sh the shaping of services, want better communication from public bo bodies, and often want to take full control of the assets in their villages, towns and cities. In some parts of the country, it seems that public bodies do well in communicating with folk and involving communities in shaping services, but in others, uh, the areas, the, the very basics of encouraging participation is sadly lacking. What do I mean by the basics? Well, in Aberdeen, a number of community councils feel that Aberdeen City Council is failing to communicate with them about planning applications and that their voices are not being heard. In Dumfries, the local government committee heard from representatives of the usual place who are trying to establish a fully accessible community cafe with a changing places toilet about their frustrations about getting a lease from the council and of the maze of being pushed from one council officer to another. I believe that participation requests and asset transfers, uh, as, uh, as seen in the Community Empowerment Bill, will help shift the balance of power to communities, but legislation itself and the additional funding will not necessarily lead to the best outcomes. The government and all public bodies must ensure that best practice is exported from places like Dundee, who seem to be doing so very well in encouraging community parties participation, to every other public body and council in our land. I know that all of us in this parliament value the work of volunteers and the third sector, and we must ensure that we remove impediments to ensure that their work continues to thrive. In the next few days, I'll be visiting Bernardo's, the Sil Silver City Surfers, and Trussell Trust Seat and Food Bank in Aberdeen. These organisations and countless others in Aberdeen and throughout Scotland serve our people well, and their efforts often make huge differences to the lives of folk and help tackle injustice and inequality. And I am so pleased that this government is putting participation at the top of its priority agenda. Thank you. Many thanks. Claire Baker to be followed by Sandra White. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, this has so far been a wide-ranging debate, but I would like to focus on the issue of land reform. Um, I welcome the announcement in the First Minister's legislative programme that the government will be bringing forward a land reform bill within this parliament. Land reform is an issue that Scottish Labour takes seriously. It was a landmark piece of legislation in the early years of this parliament, and it's one that we are willing to work with others across the chamber to achieve. Land reform is a means to delivering greater equality, social justice and promoting the public interest. 
It is 11 years since we last passed land reform legislation, but I am pleased that, although we are now seven years into an SNP government, we are now on the verge of a new land reform act. We have seen the government encourage ownership, but so far we have not seen mechanisms to change the nature of land ownership in Scotland. The bill and a land reform programme can give us the opportunity as well as the commitment of government's times and resources. Uh, we are facing a very short time scale for delivery and the necessary consultation and scrutiny of the bill will have to be concentrated if we are to see results by April 2016. We are committed to working with the government to deliver radical and meaningful change and it can be done in this session but the government must be prepared to take on the big challenges addressing the issue of maximum land holdings statutory land rights the transparency of land ownership and i welcome the statement the first minister made in that regard um, tax and beneficial benefit tax and financial benefits. Delivery in these areas will be challenging given the short timescale, but we should all commit to taking forward this agenda in this parliament and beyond. Um, I welcome the intention to establish a land reform commission, which should provide continuity and focus out with the election cycles, making recommendations for keeping our land laws current and relevant. Um, and the final report of the Land Reform Review Group provides us with that roadmap. 58 out of the 62 recommendations can be delivered with the current powers of this Parliament. And whilst I welcome the proposed Land Reform Bill, it will only be part of the solution. And I look forward to the policy statement that's anticipated next week. Uh, we need to take a comprehensive approach. We can't possibly deliver everything in this bill, but we need to be clear about the path we are on and the destination that we're headed towards. We should be thinking in the long term, where, you know, having a discussion about where in 10, 20 years' time we want to be. Scotland has a highly concentrated land ownership pattern. We should be thinking how do we encourage and support greater diversification of ownership and open up the benefits this can bring for local economic development, housing and renewable energy. Land ownership, as well as land use, need to be seen as a public interest matter because land is a finite and crucial resource. Although the headline proposals um, they dominated reporting of the Land Reform Review Group report, the significant statement made by the group was the recognition that land was a finite and crucial resource needing to be used and owned in the public interest and for the common good. This is key and it is the principle which we should use to direct public policy. So how do we do this? If we accept that land ownership patterns must change in the public interest, that clearly implies there must be ways to have the public interest tested in land transactions by potentially tackling further concentration in ownership patterns or shifting the focus to land being sold in smaller lots and smaller parcels. So what are the practical steps that can be taken within this parliament? Um, the Land Reform Review Group argued there should be upper limits to land holdings. Um, is there a point where concentrated ownership in the hands of the few becomes detrimental? Is 432 people owning 50% of private land or 16 individuals owning 10%, is that acceptable, justified or beneficial in a modern Scotland? In the interest of widening social justice and access, could there not perhaps be a public interest test or measure introduced here, for example? Um, France uses the safer system to exercise a public interest. We need to look at what kind of models we could have here. Um, do we need to look at a use it or lose it policy on developers and land speculators who are land banking? And the review group proposed a number of new bodies, but a land agency supported by Community Land Scotland and the review group seems a practical way forward that we can make um, swift progress on. If we are clear about where we're headed with land reform in Scotland, then solutions must come from across government, uh, from finance, from housing, from local government. We need to understand and act on the land dimension in all areas. We just need to look back at the Land Registration Act, which was narrowly defined within the Minister's portfolio, and we then missed an opportunity on land reform for an example of a lack of joined up government. Uh, the announcement on the removal of business rates exemption for shooting and deer stocking estates is welcome, particularly additional support this is going to give to the land fund. But are there other opportunities? Um, for example, are there opportunities open to us with the replacement of stamp duty with the land and buildings transaction tax? There are taxes and financial incentives decided by the UK government which are relevant, but we need to look at the powers we have here and how we can use them. In the current budget, the focus has been on domestic and commercial property when it comes to the land and buildings transaction tax. But is there not an opportunity there to also look at how government could influence land values if it so wished? 
Land reform is complex. It can't be delivered solely by the new minister. And at this point, I'd like to, um, to give thanks to Paul Wheelhouse for the work that he's done on land reform. And I think we've worked constructively across the parliament. I hope that can continue with the new minister. Um, if the government is serious about changing our patterns of ownership, they need to be open to the debate around all levels of government. And much of what the First Minister talked about is relevant to the Community Empowerment Bill, which is currently going through Parliament, and that has a significant role to play in opening up more opportunities. I'm we are committed you need to, to strengthening that bill, but can I just say at the moment it looks like it's been too cautious around some of the areas and there's dangers that it could be too restrictive and there's difficulty in defining and determining some of the tests that have been placed um, on that bill. And presiding officer, this proposed bill gives the Parliament an opportunity to deliver meaningful change in Scotland, and I look forward to its publication and progress. Thank you. I'm afraid we are fast running out of time in this debate. I must ask everyone to keep to the six minutes, please. Sandra White to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I welcome the First Minister to her new role and congratulate all in their appointments. And I really look forward to uh, taking forward the Scottish programme for government along with everyone else. Uh, can I also welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to legislation to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in the 2016 Scottish elections? And uh, speaking to many young people in my constituency, I certainly know they'll welcome this, uh, but also they would really like to have had an opportunity to vote in the Westminster election. So hopefully that may go forward. Uh, either from the Smith Commission or otherwise. I also welcome the strengthening of community involvement, which my colleague Kevin Stewart uh, has mentioned in his contribution. I think it's a fantastic news, which groups in my constituency will certainly benefit from, and in many other constituencies throughout Scotland also. Uh, beside an officer, I want to touch on two particular areas uh, today. One is gender equality, and the other is uh, domestic abuse. Now, when we look at gender equality, the First Minister has already mentioned this at the makeup of Scotland's new cabinet. Um, it sends out a really strong message of gender equality, and the UN obviously has held 50 50 gender split in the new cabinet. I think it's something we in the Scottish Parliament should be very, very proud of indeed. Now, we know that uh, the, currently the Scottish Parliament does not have legislative powers to address this issue. The FM has already mentioned this. I, I do understand that in August 2014, the Scottish Government wrote to the UK Government proposing a transfer of relevant provisions from the Equality Act to the Scottish Parliament. And I just wonder if the FM, whoever is closing, may have an update on that particular part of the correspondence. Uh, we also looked at the Scottish Government's Women on Board Quality through diversity consultation. That was launched in April 2014, and this proposed measures to achieve gender equality through gender quotas on public boards. The consultation was to be welcomed, and I think it's already been raised by others uh, in the Chamber, and I think uh, that particular consultation as an announcement of 50-50 by 2020 is something else that this uh, Government and this Parliament should be very proud of. However, in the long term of things, we do need to change the culture in Scotland to, to get proper gender equality. I want to touch on something else which I think will uh, provide gender equality. Uh, the commitment to increasing childcare to, will help create equality, uh, giving all three and four year olds and our most disadvantaged two year olds 600 hours of childcare per year. And, uh, we all know that it's equal to 16 hours a week during term time and plans to increase this to 30 hours a week uh, if the government is re elected. I think it would make it so much easier for mothers and parents in general to be able to go back to work. Uh, but I do want to raise a point, however, in regarding local authorities and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary for Education may want to take this particular part on board. We need to ensure that local authorities play their part in this also and ensure that there are, there are uh, you know, places there for the hours of, uh, you know, the the hours that they're able to go and into um, nurseries and uh, preschool as well. So I would hope that the Cabinet Secretary for Education would actually look at that also. If I could touch on the domestic abuse uh, issues as well, I mean, I think we all know that stopping domestic abuse uh, is a very, very crucial issue uh, for all of us, and we're all united in that particular aspect. And if I just touch on some of the things that's been done by this government, 2007, funding for initiatives to tackle domestic abuse and violence against women has 
has increased by 62 per cent, and the Scottish Government is investing 34.5 million between 2012 and 2015 to be targeted at a large range of initiatives uh, to tackle violence against women. Uh, obviously, the Clare's Law, which the First Minister mentioned today, the trial of the uh, Clare's Law in Ayrshire and Aberdeen for six months it started yesterday, I believe, 25th of November, and obviously allows men and women and men, actually, forgot to mention that, and men to access information on their new partner's offending history. It can be used by somebody concerned about a partner's abusive behaviour or by a third party. And I think that's really important, by a third party worried about someone in a potentially dangerous relationship. And I really look forward to that being rolled out throughout the rest of the country also. Uh, the consultation on introducing a criminal offence for committing domestic abuse, I think, is also to be welcomed. And legislation to look at revenge porn uh, is very welcome indeed, as is the new trafficking laws. I do look forward to the re legislation that was put forward by the First Minister, not just in the two areas I picked up on, but in other areas also. I think it's an excellent programme for government. It's looking at uh, equalities and also the social aspects as well, and it's something which this uh, Scottish Government, I think, should be proud of uh, in the years that we have been in government since 2007. We have tried to look at all the aspects of government, particularly, yes, the economy, but also the social aspects also. I thank the First Minister for putting forward the programme for government, and uh, I look forward, as I said, to working along with them. Thank you very much, President Officer. Many thanks. I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Christian Allard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased that the uh, first official uh, visit that the First Minister uh, undertook was to carers last week. Can I also extend my appreciation for the work that the 657,000 carers do in the, uh, looking after loved ones? And can I also welcome uh, the Carers Bill? I think this is timely because Friday is International Carers Rights Day, so it is right that we should have a bill uh, announced this week. Uh, many people who are carers don't see themselves as such, but uh, they are simply loving family members who, regardless of the lack of support they receive, will continue to care. And it's important we don't take advantage of that commitment, that we support and enable them and make sure that their care and role doesn't impact on their life chances. And where we can, we need to help them continue to make an income and support their continued employment. Carers save our public services over £10 billion a year, so they deserve to have good quality and suitable support. Um, the First Minister said, said in her statement that the Scottish Government had given almost £114 million a year um, to carers over the last seven years. My colleague Neil Finlay um, made a, 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 an announcement that we, it was our understanding that that was over the last seven years and not per year. And it, I would be grateful um, of some clarification in the summing up speech from the First Minister. Um, the statement and indeed the documents surrounding the Carers Bill give very little detail about what might be included in it. And it's really important that this bill is not empty words, um, but actually has some bite and gives carers uh, the access to the first class support and services they receive. I understand that carers' assessments will be renamed to carers' support plans, but we also need things in the bill that make short breaks a right for carers. We need to identify carers more easily. We need to make transitional arrangements for carers um, when they move between health board and local authorities, or indeed between health board and local authority areas, or that the person they are caring for moves between youth and adult services, or indeed that they themselves move between youth and adult services because one of the most vulnerable groups of carers are indeed young carers. Um, so we have to make sure that they particularly uh, get the support that, that they need and that they um, have their own carer support plan in place. Um, we need to tackle a lot of the challenges that they face, including um, their own advice and support services. And indeed, I heard today that Sky and Lochal's Young Carers Group are devising a toolkit for schools to make them aware of the needs of young parents carers and help them to support them. Um, we need to make sure that young carers have the same opportunities as other young people um, and also um, help them access education as they would if they were not young carers. Uh, the bill also needs to look at other promises made, for example, uh, emergency plans that was promised over three years ago and still not, has still not come to fruition. And that's something carers are really concerned about. 
Um, the statement said that it, there would be accessible ad advice, but not accessible support. We need to make sure that, that there is also support, and those are produced in a way that suits carers and that are person-centred. Uh, we also need access to appropriate, appro appropriate respite care, whether that is a day, a few hours, or indeed a weekend. It has to be what suits the carer to give them uh, the ability to continue to lead their lives. Um, the First Minister will be aware um, that Scottish Labour have pledged their support for the Scottish Youth Parliament Care Fair Share campaign, and I would really appreciate if perhaps the Carers Bill would, would allow this, the government to do the same. Not, not hugely expensive, but would make a big difference to the lives of young carers. We are also suggesting that the Care Inspectorate have responsibility for inspecting services to carers and that local authorities publicly report on an annual basis about the services they provide um, to carers. Much more needs to be done. The Carers Bill is a vehicle to do this and I very much hope that the government will... Um... First Minister. Rhoda Grant mentioned uh, a statement I made about funding uh, for carers and I would like to take the opportunity just to clarify that due to a misprint in my statement, it said that funding was per year. In actual fact, Rhoda Grant is correct. That funding was over the period 2007 to 2015. So I wanted to take the earliest opportunity just to rectify that matter. May thanks. Rhoda Grant. I appreciate that clarification and it coming so early. Can I turn very briefly, presiding officer, um, to domestic abuse um, and welcome the consultations um, on revenge porn and indeed domestic abuse legislation. But this is something that we have been calling for for quite some time and we would hope very much that this legislation would be within this parliament and maybe question if there is a need for a wide consultation since I think most people are signed up to the importance of tackling violence against women. And indeed, this Parliament has a track record of doing this, but we need to do an awful lot more. And the First Minister talked about genuinely wanting to work across the Chamber, and this is certainly an issue I think we would be more than willing um, to help her, uh, to work with her with. Um, yesterday was the start of the 16 days of action, and it was also the same day that we see um, crime figures showing that sexual offences are on the rise. And this may be because of better reporting and better detection, but it is very worrying. So could more be done? Um, could I also just um, mention briefly the trafficking... If it's briefly, because you really need to conclude. ...and exploitation bill. Can I ask if that would include sexual exploitation? Because I think that is really important and that's an opportunity to do it. Finally, I'm grateful um, that you met with Gordon Aikman and I think we all agree he's inspirational and I welcome the announcement she made today. But you will know that Gordon will be in a wheelchair before that stage in his life and will still have to pay for his care. Can I ask that you join with us and scrap um, the unfair care tax today? Once again, can I make an appeal for members to keep to their six minutes? Christian Allard to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the First Minister for a programme for government today, truly uh, inspirational, and a programme which is setting out the legislation and policies that will shape our urban and rural communities, legislation and policies that will shape our country. I believe this programme will ensure that Scotland will be both social democratic and socially just. And at the heart of this programme, we have the Land Reform Bill. Presenting officer, let me be clear for the many North East constituents I represent in rural Scotland, land reform is very much about social justice. Social justice for our young people growing up in our rural communities. And not as complex that uh, 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 the member said, Claire Baker, early on. The First Minister, First Minister speak about a radical program uh, of land reform. In the North East, in the North East this program uh, won't be seen as uh, as radical. Earlier this year, for example, in Bankery, I witnessed a packed hall full of people coming to listen to Leslie Reddock talk about a book, Blossom. This audience made no apology in declaring their strong support for land reform. Looking back, presiding officer, the people who came to listen to Leslie Reddock were not local farmers, and some, like me, were not born and bred in royal decide, but all understood that in order for our rural communities to flourish, land reform is needed from this parliament. There is a burning desire across rural Scotland to build more prosperous, fairer and better communities. 
Access to land is what our young farmers want in order to stay in the communities they were born. It's about the right to live and work where your parents live and work. I meet too many young people who have the skills and the expertise to farm, but without access to land, they just can't. Presenting officer, access to land is not all about land ownership. It's about having the mechanism to allow the land to be farmed by the people who live on it, some for generations. The land reform uh, commitment uh, uh, that uh, we talked about as much, is much as about social justice, and I think Alison Johnston talked about that, but it's about local democracy. Many look at the French Revolution, main legacy being the land reform agenda that shaped what modern France is today, a country of villages, a modern country, vibrant rural communities where social justice and local democracy are thriving. We want a little bit of that presenting officer in Scotland. Many are looking forward to see the main legacy of this Scottish Parliament to be its land reform agenda, bringing many parts of rural Scotland to the 21st century. Sometimes I wonder why so little has changed in the attitudes of people living in our rural communities here in Scotland. Why all practices belonging to the 18th century still prevail. But this is where we are at. This Parliament has the opportunity to shape our country for the better, and I look forward to debate the new land reform bill. I look forward as well to any progress this government can make on laws of succession, and I welcome the succession bill announcement from the First Minister. The feudal difference between land and other property still survive as part of Scotland's law of succession. Other European countries have moved on. The introduction of feudal ten tenure in Scotland was 900 years old. And some would call the intention of this bill to be radical. I disagree, President Officer. 900 years old legislation is not fit for the modern Scotland I choose to live in. We need to be honest about our own weaknesses and confident when addressing them. And we need to be proud of our own successes as well. If rural Scotland is to be where ideas flourish, businesses locate, and jobs are created. President Officer, I do represent the Northeast, many coastal communities as well. And I just like, just like our rural com communities, anything this government can do to empower them is very welcome. And I thank the First Minister's announcement on the Harbour's Bill. I look forward to debate it in Parliament. It's a great opportunity to reform some aspect of current Harbour's Arbor, legislation. To remove Scottish Minister's power to compel trust ports to bring forward privatisation proposal is more than welcome. I understand why the power has not been exercised by Scottish ministers since the revolution, but again, presiding officer, privatisation for me is never the answer. I saw the UK manufacturing industry being decimated by privatisation, just like many of our public services have been eroded. Coastal communities are looking forward to keeping control of their future, to keeping control of their local economy, to keeping control of their own harbours. The Harbours Bill is important for the future of our coastal communities from Peterhead to Fraserburgh, for our booming energy sector in the northeast, and of course, for our fishing industry. I would like to thank the First Minister for responding to the needs of our rural and coastal communities. A commitment to empowerment is reaching every part of the northeast of Scotland. And I Unlike for many businesses in the North East of Scotland who are paying business trade, the announcement to withdraw the business trade exemptions for shooting and, de and deer stalking is very welcome. A final Pre 30 seconds. President Officer, this programme under this First Minister will shape our communities, it will shape our countries. Scotland can see that this First Minister is leading, is leading a government with purpose, a Scottish government for all, all of us who live here. Uh, and the result, President Officer, will be a Scotland that is both socially democratic and socially just, a society based on prosperity, uh, participation and fairness. President Officer. Many thanks. I now call Murdo Fraser to be followed by George Adam. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, as Ruth Davidson pointed out earlier in the debate, this statement was trailed as a boost to the Scottish economy. I must say I struggled uh, to find many measures that would deliver that. The small business bonus is to continue, and we, and we welcome that, but was it ever in doubt? And indeed, what we see is an expansion of business rates to cover previously exempt areas. There was also trialled the expansion in childcare. But again, when we, we examine the statement, nothing new is proposed beyond what has already been announced, except, of course, that we have now, it seems, killed off the notion forever 
that only with independence can better childcare be delivered. And there was no attempt, as Ruth Davidson also pointed out, to address the issue of age discrimination in childcare. And I can illustrate this perfectly because I have two children. I have a daughter who was born in August who got a full two years nursery provision and a son born in January who got merely five terms of nursery provision. An attempt by my colleague Liz Smith to overturn this and provide equity was defeated uh, in the Education Committee, uh, despite being supported by all parties other than the SNP. So the SNP are serious about equity and social justice and improving childcare. They need to start to tackle this anomaly. The statement deals with the question of access to higher education for those from disadvantaged backgrounds, a laudable ambition. I've pointed out in this chamber many times before, Scotland's poor record compared to every other part of the United Kingdom uh, when it comes to access to higher education for those from disadvantaged backgrounds, notwithstanding tuition fees applying elsewhere in the UK. And the First Minister trumpets free education, but of course there is no evidence of a deterrent effect from a, a graduate contribution or tuition fees. Why? Because those fees come with generous bursaries which are funded from the fee income. Now, I don't know the First Minister's personal circumstances. I'm a few years older than she is, but when I went to university, I went to university on a full grant because of my parental circumstances. I suspect if in the same case I was applying today in England to go to university, I would not only be exempt from paying any fees, I would also be the beneficiary of generous bursaries. Maybe the same would apply to her. It's therefore disingenuous to suggest that she would not have been able to go to higher education if a graduate contribution were to be introduced, if that were the case, on similar lines to that applies in England. In fact, Scotland's record on uh, access to higher education is not a good one, and it needs to be improved. But I want to deal with the question of land reform. I'm a veteran of the parliamentary scrutiny in uh, 2003 of the, the Act that was then passed. Members with long memories will remember uh, our erstwhile colleague Bill Aitken railing against Mugabe-style land raids. What we have today, it seems to me, is a mishmash of proposals which will do little to improve good land use and support good practice. We have powers for ministers to intervene where the scale of land ownership or the conduct of a landlord is acting as a barrier to sustainable development. Now, we await to see the detail of this, which will be coming uh, out in due course. But on any level, this represents a massive expansion of state power. What qualifies Scottish ministers as arbiters of what is good land use or qualifies them to decide on what is an appropriate scale of land ownership? The best that can be said of this, presiding officer, is that it is a charter for lawyers. We may even have to rethink our opposition to the Human Rights Act on this side of the chamber. And we see the proposal from the Scottish Government of a land reform commission. Just what rural Scotland needs, another quangle. And then, of course, the imposition of business rates on sporting estates. The class war is alive and well in the Scottish Parliament. Has any assessment been done of the economic impact? Has any assessment been done of the cost? Has any assessment been done of the jobs that might be lost? Mr Allard will tell us. Christian Allard. I thank the member to, to, to let me having an invitation. Talking about business trade, does he not think that plenty of businesses, particularly in the north east of Scotland, find it totally unacceptable that we have to pay business trade and this large estates I don't have to pay business trade? One, two, three, so you're approaching your last minute. I look forward to Mr Allard taking that argument to the gamekeepers employed on estates in the north east of Scotland and explaining to them why the income that pays their wages is likely to be affected by this measure. But what's wrong with the Scottish Government's approach to land reform is it has an ideological opposition to ownership of large areas of land by private individuals or by private trusts. But what is important is not who owns the land, but how the land is used. Even community ownership, as we heard this week, has its own problems. There are many excellent estates, Athol estates in Perthshire with its combination of forestry, of farming, of sporting interests, tourism, energy and housing is an exemplar and it speaks volumes that the factor of Athol estates, Andrew Bruce Wooten, was so dismayed by the ideological uh, direction of the Land uh, Reform Review Group that he had to resign from it in uh, protest because it lacked, in his view, an understanding 
of the real issues. What concerns me is we're seeing a bidding war on the left between the Labour Party and the SNP, each trying to be more radical when it comes to land reform, but lacking any clear understanding of the real issues in rural Scotland. What we need is an evidence-based approach, not an ideological one, and that is what the Scottish Conservatives will provide. Thank you. And I call George Adam to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, President Officer. Can I say I welcome the First Minister's first legislative programme? And although we live in challenging times, it shows vision and provides hope for the future. Although listening, like Kevin Stewart already said, although listening to some of the opposition members, that seems to be part of a parallel universe, you know, and this Scottish Government has achieved so much since its first election in 2007, but I think one of the major issues and one of the issues that the First Minister brought up was how we support our families across Scotland, and I welcome the First Minister's commitment on childcare, because uh, in two weeks' time I will be a grandfather, and I may have a declaration to make here on the fact that uh, my daughter Jessica and John may be looking for that type of support in future years as both of them go on to work, and access to work as San Andrew White quite rightly said, is the whole reason for that policy there, because it does make economic uh, difference. And the First Minister is saying it's one of the best investments we can make, ensuring that these families do get that opportunity. And also, one of the things I agree with is the fact that uh, the legislative uh, programme is actually on the three key principles based on, founded on, of priorities, participation, pr and prosperity. In fairness, actually, the priorities uh, was, wasn't one of the commitments there. Uh, but I would say that's really uh, the important part of it as well, because First Minister has already announced that uh, in the SNP 2016 manifesto will set out the ambitious plan to almost double childcare provision. And uh, by the, if we do get another term, as already has been mentioned, then there would be more uh, hours for our uh, children and families there as well. The Scottish Government has expanded and funded hours by 45 per cent since 2007, and there's still more work to be done. But that's worth up to £707 per child per year, and that's quite a big investment as well. But, you know, as we look at this debate, as with everything else, further devolution of tax and benefits will enable us to unlock the resources required to support the transformational change in provision. Access to tax revenues and benefits savings arising from increased labour market participation will contribute to the cost of achieving this type of transformational change. But with more powers comes more responsibility. And as every debate seems to be about what happens next, and what happens next is we have the challenge of before the Smith Commission, because prom not at the moment, thanks. Promises were made and expectations from our citizens are high. Let us not forget that it was Gordon Brown who said we're going to be within a year or two as close to a federal state as can be. Now, Gordon Brown underwrote the infamous vow. He became the credible voice, the hero of the No campaign, if you, if you wish. Within a year or two, he said... Now, where is this credible voice? Where is the credible voice gone at a time where Scotland needs people to actually put their arguments forward? He's off. He's off on the dinner, uh, after dinner speaking circuit. And his other cronies, Westminster cronies, Party, Danny Alexander, please, so has here, called Mr. Adam. the proposals for effective home rule and unprecedented new powers that put us irreversibly on towards a federal UK. So, with all that in mind, is it not the case that we give this Parliament the powers that the people of Scotland want? We can talk about making the type of transformational change that we all want with these powers. But in education already, the Scottish Government has a strong commitment to drive and improvement and ensuring equ uh, uh, equity and attainment uh, throughout uh, Scotland. You know, we only have to look at the already mentioned by the First Minister. Raising Attainment for All programme, which was launched already in June 2014, it is a programme that is trying to work in our commitments to ensure, in our com co uh, communities, to ensure that a child isn't a victim of the postcode, they get the opportunity to be able to be part of education and be all they can be in their future. And that is what the First Minister is trying to uh, do here. But all that's in stark contrast with the situation we find from the Westminster elite, because they currently believe they're going back to business as per usual. Yes, no problem. Liz Smith, uh, I thank the, minister, the member for taking the intervention. Could he, could he explain what it is that prevents the SNP from changing the birthday discrimination when it comes to nursery provision. That is nothing whatsoever to do with Westminster policy. George Adam. 
Can I say we're talking about transformational change in this debate here. We're talking about being able to give young people the opportunity to move forward. So I'm saying for us, everything connected, we need to have the powers and the levers within this parliament. That were promised. That were promised by all the no parties. Roger, so, President Officer, all of this has been achieved during very challenging times and Westminster's continually promises yet more austerity. As I said earlier, this programme builds on the Scottish Government's previous work, but we need to ensure that Westminster delivers on their promises that they made to the people of Scotland. We need to ensure that we have the powers that make the transformational cage that my constituents, all of our constituents want. Much good work has already happened, but we must continue to be ambitious and, as the First Minister says, be bolder in our ideals. Presiding officer, I welcome this programme for government and look forward to working towards the type of country we all want. Thank you very much. I call Sarah Boyack to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the commitment that is expressed in the First Minister's statement today to review the council tax and to look at new ways of funding local government. I think this is both long overdue and hugely welcome. Given the, the massive pressures that we can now see on our local services, particularly our schools and our care services, and the lack of capacity of our councils to act with the civic leadership role that I think we expect them to carry out, for example, in a community renewables or town centres, this is a critical issue, and I very much welcome the fact that we have a statement in front of us which puts that centre stage. Now, the First Minister said that the council tax freeze would continue. Um, I think that means effectively that certainly continues next year and the year after. I would certainly like her to review the issue of fully funding that council tax freeze because that is one of the key issues that comes back from local colleagues at the local government level. I think a challenge is that the council tax freeze hasn't benefited those on the lowest incomes who particularly rely on council tax benefit to survive. And there are also impacts on many other vulnerable adults, in particular older people and people with disabilities who are finding their support services being cut back, rationed, or that they're having to pay for services that used to be free. So there is a cost to the current situation financially. And as Jackie Bailey mentioned, the loss of 70,000 jobs in local government since 2008 has made a huge impact in terms of the capacity to deliver the range of services. There is scope for more efficiency, but we're now at a point, I think, after the prolonged... Oh, lovely. I was predicting that before two minutes were out. Yes, of course. Kevin Stewart. Uh, there has been oft-quoting of the 70,000 jobs. Uh, could Ms Boyack maybe give us an indication of how many of those jobs have been transferred to arm's-length organisations that have been set up by councils? Sarah Boyack. Right, well, I think the key thing is that the this number of people in local government that have gone does impact on the strategic thinking and the delivery of services. So it's both those things. It's not just the output of service delivery. It's the fact that in many councils, there's no longer the expertise to take on the challenging, innovating opportunities that need to be um, kept. It's clear now that the Concordat is dead, if not buried. It wasn't mentioned in this year's budget. So it is important, I think, as the new First Minister takes office, that we move on from the past. I know I thought Kevin Stewart was going to intervene on his committee's recommendation for cross-party talks. That's something that many of us have supported. I think the reason it's important is getting a new system in place has to have buy-in not just across this chamber, but it has to have buy-in across council chambers across the country. Because if you look at the range of political involvement, it really is something that all of us need to be part of. So I'd welcome the cross-party nature of the Commission and the timescale. I think it is important that if we're looking at designing um, effective replacement for council tax, that we get that right. Now, I welcome the fact that, that there's been a lack of detail on the type of system uh, signalled by the Scottish Government. I hope that means that the Scottish Government is prepared to take a wider view and go beyond the previous support for local income tax. Uh, many of us have criticisms of it. It's not local. The rate would have to be significantly higher than previously suggested by the Scottish Government, and it would hit young people in particular. So I hope that means that we can maybe move on. And there have certainly been reports in the last couple of years that would suggest potential ways forward. Um, in our own commission, um, the Labour Party's Devolution Commission, I was very keen that we looked at 
not just a new property tax, but look at the widening the tax base for local government in general. As the Scottish Government itself gets more tax powers and more accountability, surely that should be on the agenda for our local government colleagues as well. That has to be unfinished business. So I think the work done by our Commission and then by the Strengthening Local Democracy Commission both point in the direction of new property taxes. Now, we could all agree that the current council tax is not fair, it's not effective, and it's well out of date. But property, I think, needs to be on the agenda if we're looking at designing a new tax system. If we look across Europe, it's the most regularly used system to provide a key part of local government finance. And it has also got to be about broadening the range of resource that comes to local government. The amount that local government raises by its own hand, notwithstanding the council tax freeze, is now 18%. So that leaves a, a big challenge, I think. It means that we, not just, we don't just need to look at the council tax, we also need to look at fair funding across the country, the issue of pooling and sharing, and critically the issue of funding what are national priorities set out in national legislation, but are also local priorities where local councils might want to deliver those services in different ways, according to geography, according to social need. So it's important, I think, that when we see this new commission, that it doesn't just look at the council tax in isolation, we have to make sure that there's robust funding for local government going forward. Because you only need to look at the announcements over the last couple of weeks. The hits on class sizes, the teacher number drops, the library closures that are being suggested. Uh, no, Ms Boyax, already, in the last minute. You've already come in. The crisis that we've got in social care, and I, I thought it was interesting that local government is going to have to pay extra into the pot to tackle the social care crisis. We've got an urgent problem in terms of resources at the local level for providing for the range of vulnerable adults and older people that, that are not just a problem to be dealt with now. This is a, this is a current problem. It's not a future problem. Unison's Time to Care pro, uh, campaign makes that clear. So the scale of the challenge means that we need more than, than is in this report today. But I very much welcome the fact that we'll have a cross-party commission. I think all of us need to engage in that process and make it work. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the First Minister's commitments to social justice and to representing all of the people. Therefore, I will focus, following on from uh, the previous speaker, on older people who, as the First Minister has said in her speech, were carers for spouses and children, but indeed, First Minister, sometimes they're carers for their own parents. Because what is an older person? They're not a homogenous group. They are as individualistic as any other age group. Indeed, to define older people is tricky in itself. Most people tend to think that somebody is older if they're 15 years older than where they are at that time. But for the sake of debate, let's say between 55 and 95, 40 years, some age range. And in 2012, there's over 1 million Scottish pensioners. So far, the Scottish Government hasn't done badly. It's not all well out there, but for this age group. The concessionary bus pass is a wonderful asset. It's a, it gives you social care, it takes you out and about, you're included, it's good for your mental well-being, keeps you active. 77,000 pensioners receive free personal care, courtesy of this Parliament. 40 million cuts from the UK to the council tax benefit was plugged by this government to help 200,000 people over 65. And importantly, the Public Bodies Joint Working Act puts a duty on local authorities to offer people assessed as needing social care an option to design their own care package. I welcome the investment to reduce delayed discharge. This is deleterious to the patient, often an older person who wants to get home, and also those waiting for treatment. Community engagement is very important to the individual who should be at the centre of decisions. In fact, in the recent Old People's Assembly here, it was proposed that there should be an older person on the board of, say, an NHS or a housing association. What about a wee quota there? It's very fashionable. By way of attendance allowance, which I presume, I may be wrong, may be devolved, this will at last do something about the iniquity of the funding savings that go to the Treasury, some millions of pounds that they've saved because we're paying for free personal care and claim is not being made for attendance allowance. But I want to move on from this idea that older people are a problem. 
They are a huge asset. I love this picture on H NHS Health Scotland. By the way, it's not a self-portrait, but the lady with the boxing gloves ready to take on the world. You see, pensioners are a huge economic asset. In the UK, they contribute in tax some 45 billion per annum. Their spending power is some 76 billion per annum. There's a hidden value of their volunteering around 10 billion and another 10 billion through charity and family donations. They are a major economic force. Pensioner power rules, okay, so they're not all a problem. They give very much back to society. So sometimes we might even refer to them as the social glue that we have for us, much needed. So I'm pleased that the First Minister and the Scottish Government programme recognises the substantial contribution while recognising the needs of Scotland's older people. And I have to say, I'm looking at the Cabinet Secretary, Alec Neil there, we had a bit of a stramash in the tea room trying to work out what 60-year-olds were called. We came up with sexagenarian, we've got to say that properly, or a hexagenarian. So my hope is that having this sexagenarian or hexagenarian in the Cabinet in the position of social justice, focusing also on older people will ensure, because we don't always need legislation, we need policies that recognise... Order, not, please, on the front benches. Them, am I being heckled? Uh, the, I'll take my boxing gloves. We need policies <laughs> not only that support older people when they have their needs, but recognise the huge amount they give to society. Remember the lady with the boxing gloves. She may come after you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now call Elaine Murray. Uh, Elaine Murray will be followed by Angela Constance. Well, I'm glad I'm going to be a sexagenarian next month. That uh, makes me feel a lot better about it. Uh, I want to start by congratulating the new Cabinet Secretary for Justice uh, and the Minister for Community Safety as he's in the Chamber to their new roles. And the First Minister last week indicated that she was keen to listen to the views of opposition members. And it is in that spirit that I am putting forward some suggestions on behalf of my party to the new justice team for consideration. I look forward to working for them, but obviously with the situation in my party at the moment, I can't guarantee how much longer I'll be able to do that. Uh, but I, have, uh, I certainly look forward to, to working with them. Uh, one of the pieces of legislation, as Murdo Fraser already said, which has already been introduced is the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland, uh, bill, which is sometimes, I think, incorrectly described as ending automatic early release. Uh, currently, all prisoners ser serving less than a four-year sentence must be relieved, released after serving half of that sentence, and that was some 14, over 14,000 people in 2012-13 uh, who were sending, spe uh, spe uh, serving less than four years, and that bill won't affect these at all. They will still be released after uh, two years. The bill actually only applies to sex offenders serving over four years and other offenders serving 10 years or more, and that's around 1% of the current prison population. Now, obviously, there will be significant implications on the prison service and prison populations of automatically uh, early release was abolished altogether. And I think to propose that would, of course, be fiscally irresponsible. But it could be argued that the bill is tokenistic. Uh, what I would like to suggest is that we take a more radical approach in the longer term towards sentencing uh, and reducing reoffending and reconviction. In 2006, the Sentencing Commission for Scotland produced a report on the early release of prisoners and their supervision on release. Uh, and that report recommended that at a time when a custodial sentence is imposed, the sentence should explain the effect of the sentence so that the offender, the victim, the media and the public at large are in no doubt about what the sentence means in terms of the time to be served in custody and that which may be served in the community. Victim Support Scotland, in a written submission to the Justice Committee in May, said that they wanted to see a system in which sentences are straightforward and understandable to the victims and to the wider community. Uh, the bill doesn't actually add clarity to what a sentence means because it would actually still be possible for the parole board to release a a prisoner after serving half a sentence. What I'm suggesting is that we look at an extension of the approach taken in the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Scotland Act of 2007, which hasn't yet been enacted, which would be for the sentencer at the time of passing the sentence to prescribe the minimum term the offender will remain in custody. When the offender reaches the end of the minimum period, he or she would be assessed with regard to the risk to the public and also the engagement with programmes in prison aimed at reducing reoffending. 
if the offender poses little risk and has taken the opportunity to address their offending behaviour, he or she could then be released under supervision. If not, a period of custody up to a maximum limit could then be served. That, of course, would require a change in sentencing policy and would require to be supported by a mandatory national programme of education, skills development and drug or alcohol rehabilitation available to all offenders. And also, I think, standardised methods of recording engagement, accrediting prisoners for their skills uh, gained or the recovery uh, programmes indulged in. Where appropriate, this could continue, in fact, should continue in the community after the offender has been released. I feel that the way to uh, tackle high prison population should be through prevention and offending, uh, addressing reoffending. And I think there are op opportunities to extend that further uh, in how we investigate that. My second suggestion uh, relates to the controversial uh, issue of the abol uh, ab abolition of the requirement for corroboration. We know that uh, Lord Bonamy's review group on safeguards is due to report in, in April, but having attended one of the sessions, it was clear that the remit is still investigating safeguards when the requirement is abolished and not looking at whether the requirement could be modified to provide better access to justice to, to, uh, to, for the victims of person-to-person -person crimes such as sexual and domestic abuse. And I wonder if the new Cabinet Secretary would look at extending the remit of Lord Bonamy's group to include that. I'm sure if he did so, uh, he would have the agreement of all opposition parties. Our third suggestion concerns the Police and Fire Services Reform Scotland Act of 2012. We, have, we know that there are uh, problems with accountability, particularly of Police Scotland, uh, uh, and these problems have surfaced since the single Police and Fire and Rescue Services were formed in April uh, 2013. Local accountability in particular is far weaker than many of us were promised, and I would like the new team to review how the Act is working in practice. I am pleased that the new Scottish Government has adopted the bills proposed by Jenny Mara on human trafficking. Uh, I hope that will be taken forward with the same uh, force and purpose that Jenny's original proposals are. But I am disappointed not to see Neil Finlay's lobbying bill. I, I thought that had also been uh, adopted by the Scottish Government. Uh, and I, want, I wonder if it has not been progressed this, this uh, year, whether there will be time to progress that. The previous Justice Secretary also was less sympathetic to the proposals put forward, forward by my colleague Patricia Ferguson for an inquiry into Death Scotland Bill. I know that there is a, a proposals for a fatal, fatal uh, accident inquiry bill, uh, but the consultation oddly seemed to spend a lot of time criticising uh, Patricia Ferguson's bill. Uh, I felt that is disappointing, and I wonder whether the new team might be prepared to meet with Ms Ferguson to discuss the aims of her bill and whether, in fact, some of those aims could be incorporated into the new legislation. Now, I think there are many opportunities for uh, consensus and for collaboration. If the government is serious about doing that, we are serious about uh, taking part genuinely in discussion and we, we volunteer our views uh, in good faith uh, in the hopes that you are prepared in this new cabinet to listen to some of the things that we have to say and to discuss that with us. If you, if you are prepared to do that, we are certainly prepared to take part in those discussions. Thank you, Ms Murray. I now call the last speaker um, in this part of the debate, under Constance, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. This Government's ambition for radical reform remains undiminished, and the programme for government, uh, as uh, detailed today, is very much the springboard for the future. The success of our nation depends very much on us all working together to deliver a stronger economy and to build a fairer Scotland. And fairness and prosperity go hand in hand. We can't have one without other. Uh, that's why our commitment to introduce uh, a Scottish business pledge is so important, ensuring that in turn for public money and public support that we can work with Scottish businesses to deliver on that agenda for fairness. Because fairness is fundamental to growing the Scottish economy. So therefore, in the programme of government, we are focused on more and better paid jobs uh, with a view to continuing our principal goal of sustainable economic growth. We are also focused, presiding officer, on tackling inequality and passing power to people and to our communities. Now, this afternoon's debate has been colourful in part. There has also been much consensus as well. And it is important to note the consensus across the Chamber on the First Minister's commitment that there should be no social care charges for those living with a terminal illness in the latter stages of their life. 
It was also uh, welcome to hear the unanimity around the Human Trafficking Bill and Clare's Law. And land reform, our proposals for radical land reform, um, I think are largely welcomed, but of course uh, we look forward to um, a spicy debate uh, between uh, Murdo Fraser and uh, Christian Allard. And I also noted in the First Minister's opening remarks that there was indeed spontaneous applause right across the chamber for her announcement on healthcare environment inspectors who have the power to order ward closures when that's in the interests of patient safety. And it was also heartening to hear that there is indeed support in this chamber for the franchise to be extended to 16 and 17 year olds who have done us proud in the recent referendum campaign. And it is, of course, uh, a great pity that those 16 and 17 year olds uh, won't uh, be allowed to participate in the next election, which is the Westminster election next May. Presiding officer, on a very personal note, I'm proud to be uh, part of a government with its first woman first minister and a cabinet that is gender balanced with 50-50 uh, women and men. And we are one of only three OECD countries and we have been commended uh, by the UN for the cabinet becoming uh, a role model. But I want to be clear, presiding officer, this is not just about the position of a few women and a few positions of leadership. It's not about a few women climbing through the cracks or the gaps in the glass ceiling. This is about kicking open the door of opportunity for all women and others to achieve their full potential. And I'm very pleased that the First Minister has announced that we'll work towards a voluntary target of 50-50 representation right across the public, private and third sector. Of course, we would very much welcome in this chamber uh, the devolution of equalities legislation, which would allow us to take further action if need be, if voluntary measures uh, do not succeed. And this government has also uh, written uh, well in advance of the referendum to the UK government seeking uh, a Section 30 order for the devolution of equality powers. We know that public appointments are improving. We know that 42% of applicants uh, to public boards are women. But we also know that there is much more to do, particularly when the number of women appointed as chairs remains far too low. Rightly so, presiding officer, much of the debate this afternoon has focused uh, on childcare and it is welcomed both as the best investment for children but also as a foundation stone to our economy. Because we do know that lack of access to affordable, flexible, high quality childcare is indeed the biggest barrier to women getting into work. And I'm proud that this government over the next two years will invest £329 million that we will have 16 hours of childcare and early learning a week for three and four year olds uh, and eligible two year olds. And that by 2020, that we will double that uh, to 30 hours a week to eligible children. Of course, with independence, that 30 hours a week uh, would be available to children aged between one and five years old. And I take some caution uh, about emulating the UK government in their record on childcare because when it comes to actually delivering for two-year-olds, they appear to have over-promised yet under-delivered. Poseidon officer, the First Minister spoke about her personal mission and how the importance of quality-free education was imperative to her to pursue uh, her chosen career. And that, of course, is an objective shared right across this government, because there are many of us now in government positions who are the first in their family to go to university. Children 20, 30 or more years ago from working class backgrounds that took that step into higher education. So we want to do more to improve access to higher education from those young people for, from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. We know, according to the latest UCAS statistics, that the situation is indeed improving, but it is not improving fast enough, and we will not demure from that acknowledgement. So we'll set out our ambitions, we'll set out our targets, that a child born today should indeed have an equal chance of participating in higher education. And the situation is similar with attainment. 
education in Scotland is indeed improvement, but we do have to address the long-standing issue with the attainment gap, and we will indeed uh, pick up the pace, and this programme for government has very much uh, signalled that. Presiding officer, in this government, we accept that there is always a case to do more within our existing resources and existing powers. But there is also, also a case for more powers to come to this Parliament, because the foundations of a strong and fair society are at the very heart of the debate about powers with a purpose. And take, for example, the attainment debate. The very heart of the attainment debate is the debate about poverty. Poverty doesn't stop at the school gates, and eradicating poverty is indeed the greatest challenge, but it's also the greatest prize. Thank you. This debate will continue uh, tomorrow afternoon. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 11682 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting up a business programme, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11682. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11682, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11683, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting up a stage one timetable for the British Sign Language Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion to should, uh, press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11683. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11683, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 11684 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage one timetable for the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the address speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11684. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11684, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureaus. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions number 11685, 11686, and 11688 on approval of SSI's on block. Moved on block. The question on these motions will put a decision time to which we now come. I propose to ask a single question on motions number 11685, 11686 and 11688 on approval of SSIs. If any member objects a single question being put, please say so now. No member has objected, so the question is that motion number 11685, 11686 and 11688 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of SSIs be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We move to members' business. Members to leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.